Uh, good morning, everybody. You're, you're very welcome again back to the Institute. I'm delighted to see so many of you here this morning, on which I think we have decided is the first day of winter since there was hailstones <laughs> just outside. Uh, just before I begin, you know the housekeeping rules, if you can turn off your mobile and... Um, presentation is on the record, but the Q&A, as you know, uh, is, is Chatham House rules. And today's presentation, as you see, towards a European strategy for artificial intelligence is very timely. As you know, AI has caught the public's imagination, you know, from driverless cars to the impact of medicine. And we are all wondering about strategies. Different countries have, have completed their strategies, like China, I think the UK and, and Finland. But today we're focusing not on Irish strategy, but on European strategy. I'm sure the Irish strategy will come up, Barry. And in last April, you may remember that the Commission established a blueprint for a three-pronged approach to artificial intelligence. The first, an increase in public and private investment. Secondly, the preparation for socio-economic change. And thirdly, and I think really importantly, an agreement on the appropriate ethical and legal framework. And this was, they set up a high level expert group, uh, working group, and this group is charged with supporting and elaborating this strategy. And Professor Barry O'Sullivan is the vice chair of the group. But for the most part, to date, EU's AI strategy is, remains unarticulated beyond these commitments. And it forms largely on this high-level group, really, to establish this policy and to look at these broader commitments and the completion of coordinated action plan. And Barry is going to tell us how they're getting on with that. And um, we're really very lucky to have Professor O'Sullivan here this morning with us. Not that he, it was hard for him to get here, but he is so busy. I think we were saying lately he barely sleeps between all his commitments. But he is, as you know, a distinguished academic um, and researcher. He's the founder of, of director of the SFI funded Insight uh, Centre for Data Analytics, Analytics based in UCC, a member of the Royal Irish Academy. I'm not going to go through all his his accomplishments and awards, but needless to say, just to say to you that he has received national, which is always good, Irish awards, but also international awards for his work. He's brought in an enormous amount of money to UCC mm -hmm. in terms of his research. And I'll just give you one example. He is an advisor to the Computational Sustainability Network, a network of universities in the USA led by Cornell, Princeton, Stanford, Georgia, Tech, and many others. So we're really lucky to have such a distinguished person here today. And I know, Barry, your presentation will give us an overview of AI, but also perhaps position us where we are on the European strategy. <coughs> so thank you very much for thank coming. You. We look forward to your present. Thanks. Well, thank you, Joyce. Um, no pressure then. <laughs> so thanks, everybody, for coming this morning. Um, so, uh, yes, I don't get to sleep very much, um, and had you phoned me at 4 o'clock this morning, I would still have been working, uh, which is crazy. Um, I should have told them about that phone call. <laughs> so, um, I suppose the, so I suppose I should start off by saying that um, this, uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on in AI at the moment from a policy point of view. So, uh, the European Commission have published a variety of documents that I'll mention during the talk. Um, and I suppose the high-level expert group is tasked with three things. It's tasked with, one, coordinating a thing called the AI Alliance. So if you're not a member of the AI Alliance, you can join. So Google it. And I'll talk about it during the, um, during the talk. And you can, you can basically articulate your views on how European AI strategy should evolve. Um, there are two deliverables. One deliverable is a set of ethical guidelines for artificial intelligence in Europe. So how should we um, basically uh, help companies to demonstrate that they have considered um, a variety of ethical issues in developing their products. Um, the European strategy on AI is human-centered. So Europe sees itself as developing a human-centered approach to AI. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means as I go, th as I go through. 
And the other piece that's, um, that we're involved in is developing a set of recommendations for investment and policy for AI in Europe. So the European Commission believes that by 2020, well, it wishes that by 2020, there will be um, basically an investment of 20 billion per annum, which is a crazy amount of money, um, invested in artificial intelligence in Europe um, from 2020. And about one-fifth of that will come from the Europe European Commission. The remainder will come from member states and the remain um, and uh, European industry. So, for example, Science Foundation Ireland are here today. So the Commission would count, for example, their investments in centres like ADAPT and Insight and Lero and so on, and any investments that they might make going forward in CRTs and so on, as part of that 20 billion. But um, obviously that gets us so far. And what the Commission would like the uh, high-level expert group to do is create a set of guidelines and uh, policies that incentivize European industry to invest even more. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about this as a, a tale of many AI strategies. And I suppose there's two parts. As Joy says, there's a, a brief potted history on AI just to give you a sense of, I suppose, my view of where AI has come from and where it's going what the issues are, and that sort of sets up then what we're concerned about from an AI point of view in terms of ethics and so on. Um, in December, I, I suppose the next big event that's going to happen on the AI calendar is on December 5th, the European Commission will publish a coordinated plan on artificial intelligence, um, which I've seen um, a, a confidential version of. And this essentially becomes, um, I suppose this becomes the European strategies for member states if they already haven't got a, uh, a strategy in AI. Now, of course, it's very, it's very broad and accommodating, but um, a number of states, as, um, as Joy says, have, have already published their own strategies. And I can go into great length as to what is in those things. Um, but I suppose when you read them, what you find is that they all say pretty much the same thing. <laughs> you know, so uh, everybody has been busy doing exactly the same piece of work all over Europe, which is, um, which is what Europe is often, often very, very famous for. So um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm on this tweet machine thing. Um, so uh, what's AI? So I suppose if you read, um, so I suppose, you know, we're, not, we're in Ireland, so I suppose we should make a claim to being one of the fathers of, uh, or mothers or whatever, of AI. So in... Um, so George Boole worked on the laws of thought in UCC, then Queen's College, Cork. Um, this is his personal copy, which you'll find in the UCC library. I'd encourage you to go and have a look at the papers. Um, so in that book, he attempted to, I suppose, develop the logical um, basis for reasoning. Um, and uh, it's widely regarded as one of, the, um, one of the big pieces of work in artificial intelligence. Of course, there are pieces of work uh, that predate that. I suppose the people often think of the Turing test as the uh, as the start of AI. So Alan Turing in 1950 came up with this uh, this concept of a Turing test, which um, is basically a thought experiment to some extent. And the AI community don't really consider it as a serious test for whether something is demonstrating AI or not. But um, the, the only example I have of it being passed is actually on Tinder. Um, <laughs> So there's an artist, a friend of mine in the UK, who's developed Lady Shatterley's Tinderbot, which is a chatbot based on conversations, on, on dialogue from Lady Shatterley's lover. Uh, sorry. And, um, and it, it basically confuses about 70% of men believe that it's, uh, it's actually a real person, um, which, which means that it has passed the Turing test for men. <laughs> Uh, women are, are only fooled by about, I think one in 20 women are, f are fooled only for a brief moment that this actually might be something real. But men think it's, really it's a really flirtatious individual. Um, so uh, we're safe on that, on that score. Um, so AI as a term, of course, was developed in 1950 by these, these fellows. Um, this is the Dartmouth workshop in AI that took place in, um, in Massachusetts. And they believe that, that essentially AI could be solved as a 12-week project. And we're at least 12 weeks away from AI 70 years later. Um, and I suppose th there's a number of reasons for that. One thing that they didn't understand is, I suppose, the, the concept of computational intractability, um, which I won't get into because it's a very, it's a very uh, technical area. But basically, the, idea, but basically the, the concept that some problems were essentially intractable, that you could not find <coughs> solutions problems in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and by reasonable, I mean in time that's sub-exponential. And they did not know that such problems existed. Um, and in a sense, 
AI is, is dogged by uh, these sorts of problems. So this basically held up and still holds up um, progress in AI. And some computer scientists call this the P versus MP problem, which, I, which if somebody really wants to know about it, I'll, I'll bore you at great length about it, but I'll leave it, th I'll leave it at that. Um, if you look at textbooks, you'll find that AI is very siloed. So people tend to work in particular areas. So if you were to basically go to any university in Ireland and tip somebody on the shoulder and say, well, are you working in AI? They would say yes. And you would say, well, what area? And they would give you one of these areas, probably. So the, the field is very, very siloed. Um, and, um, and that's to be expected. So people, uh, people focus on very specific aspects. Very few people work on the big problems in AI. So actually building a machine that, um, that sort of replicates human thought. So this idea of strong AI, things like Stephen Hawking and, and, uh, Stephen Hawking and, other, and others would say are existential threats to humanity. Nobody's essentially working on these things. Um, so, uh, which is comforting, um, because uh, you know, as H H Hawking claimed that AI was the last big technology that human beings would ever develop. Fortunately, nobody's actually working on it, um, so we have nothing to worry about. But the big thing that's happened in the last 10, 15 years is the advent of data. And so, three things have happened in AI. One is the availability of massive amounts of data, which is why we have centers like ADAPT and Insight and others in Ireland, for example. Um, exploiting different aspects of it. Um, so you often hear statistics like in the last 10, 15 years, in the last one year, um, more data has been created than all of the history of humanity for the previous, you know, <coughs> since t time memorial. And that's probably true, but as I always say, Sturgeon's law applies, which is that 95% of everything is crap. So most of the data we have isn't actually particularly useful or whatever, but, um, um, but there is vast amounts of it. Developments in, um, obviously, machines have become very, very uh, fast. Um, so if you're a software company and, you, and you've done nothing for the last 10 years, then your software product is now a million times faster than it was in 2005, because the software you're using is about a 1,000 times faster than it was in 2005, and the hardware itself is about a 1,000 times faster. So just by drinking coffee and staring at your belly button, your technology has become a million times faster. Um, and of course, algorithms that were developed in the 60s finally now have an opportunity to work. Um, but I suppose all of this work is basically around uh, perception problems. So the whole deep learning revolution that we hear about is really focused on perception. And I suppose while I'm an AI researcher, I'm a deep learning um, cynic. Um, and basically I, have a, I own a very cute Labrador and her ability is basically equivalent to essentially what, what deep learning systems do. I can train her to recognize you know, a piece of meat from a carrot, and she can do that extremely accurately. But you can sit down with her and you can ask her, well, why do you think that's meat and why do you think that's carrot? And she won't, she's not able to tell you. And guess what? Deep learning systems aren't able to tell you either. Um, so we should be very, very careful about how we consider AI um, and the progress that has been made. Because essentially, while massive breakthroughs have been made in terms of applications, we know nothing more about artificial, about intelligence than we did you know, 50 years ago, in fact. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a misnomer. So we need, we need to be very, very careful about these sorts of things. Um, so I suppose you know, artificial intelligence is not machine learning, which is what you hear about. It's a subfield. And you often hear about deep learning, which is a subfield of that again. Um, I suppose just to, just, to close, just to close the loop in some sense, um, George Boole is the father of logical AI, and he, uh, Jeff Hinton is the father of deep learning, and uh, there was a family resemblance, I think you'll, you'll admit, uh, because George Boole, in fact, is his great-great-grandfather. So if you're ever in Canada, um, you can claim to come from the country where, um, where Jeff Hinton's uh, great-great-grandfather uh, comes from. And don't, don't make a big deal about that to Jeff, because Jeff believes that Boole got it completely wrong. Uh, that that um, AI is essentially pattern matching, um, and it is not in any way logical. Um, and of course, I think in recent times, he's actually admitted that that's maybe not true. <laughs> right, so, um, so I suppose just in terms of uh, progress, into, in 1996, you might, have, you might remember Deep Blue, this big IBM chess playing program. Um, it was a search method um, in 2007, people moved on. So a lot of progress in AI has been around games, in fact. So in 2007, people started looking at um, Texas Hold'em and games like this because they had an interesting dimension to them, which was around bluffing. So could you fool a human being into thinking? So could an AI system actually learn how to uh, be dishonest in some sense and be strategic around convincing somebody that it, it knew something that, um, that it was worth 
claiming to know something that it didn't really have or that it didn't really know. And in 2007, AI systems were pretty much on par with human beings. Um, in 2017, these systems completely um, were far superior to human beings at playing Texas Hold'em. Um, and I think, you know, this is a, Thomas Santom from Carnegie Mellon is the, uh, is the father of Libratus, which is a system for Texas Hold'em playing. Um, and I suppose what, what Thomas will tell you if you ask him, but you have to know the question to ask him, is that the amount of electricity required to power Libratus for three weeks was about $50 million. So to say, so this played against four kids, basically, four 19, 20, 21 year olds, um, whose noodle in their skull is about, uh, is about seven watts. Um, and if you try to read a book under a seven watt light, you don't get very far. Uh, but this thing was basically consuming about $50 million worth of power, which is more power than a human brain consumes in about 5,000 lifetimes. If they did, so, th so this machine was, it does have superhuman capabilities, which, which it should have, because it has superhuman power uh, to do so. Um, you heard of, um, you heard of um, uh, Jeopardy, which uh, is a game that fell to AI, as the expression is. But I think I would caution about that as well, because obviously we don't have the power of the internet in our heads at any moment in time. As my, as my nine-year-old son says, when he asks me a question and I give him an answer, he says, well, Dad, do you know that or do you just Google know it? Um, and of course, Jeopardy was basically uh, is something that sort of Google knows things. It doesn't really know things at all. Um, so AlphaGo fell to AI um, in 2016, um, and in fact, I suppose when you look at the details, which is a tremendous technical achievement, there's no doubt about it. Um, these are fantastic technical achievements. But basically, AlphaGo, in order to, to play against uh, this rather, this rather sad-looking person here, um, Lee Sedal, it played more AlphaGo games. Uh, it played every AlphaGo <coughs> game that's ever been played in history, and more AlphaGo than would be that you that would so as much AlphaGo as you could possibly play in about 6,000 lifetimes if you did nothing other than play AlphaGo. So the damn thing should be pretty good at playing AlphaGo, right? So, um, and it's still, you know, while it beat him, it didn't beat him um, as convincingly as you might think, uh, given all of those resources, right? So, um, so we, need to, we need to look very cautiously at AI in terms of the progress. And you might sort of feel it odd that an AI person is saying that, but one of the problems is that if we don't, if we don't um, check the hype, then, um, then as scientists, we're, we're you know, not doing the right thing. But also, um, there might be an AI winter, another AI winter as a, co as a consequence of what we're promising. So, and of course, this has moved into other areas like, um, like uh, biomedical science, for example. So you'll often hear things like, uh, you know, radiology is now um, dominated by AI. Cancer diagnosis is dominated by AI. And that's, you know, te that's technically true in some sense. Um, self-driving cars, we've seen, we've seen, those we've seen the evidence of self-driving cars. Lots of issues come up in self-driving cars, like questions like liability. So if a car kills you, who is liable for that? And nobody knows, is basically the short version. Um, nobody knows who you, who you get to sue. Nobody knows who it is is at fault. Um, and self-driving cars also highlight an interesting statistic, an, an interesting question, which is, I was talking to some medical people yesterday, I was speaking at the health uh, management uh, conference. Um, if a, if a self-driving car kills you, even though it's much safer at driving than a human being, um, we, see, we, we seem to feel very hard done by by that. So interestingly, we, we hold technology to a higher level of account than we do human beings. At this point, it is true that self-driving cars are statistically safer at driving than human beings, but yet we still want human beings to drive cars, um, which is kind of curious. Um, so it's all over the place. AI, you can't you can help but, um, but encounter it. I was involved in a company called Four Impacts. If you ever walk through the ILAC Center, um, We've developed, so those big advertising pods stand close to one of them. You'll see four impacts in the bottom, and you'll see a camera at the top. And the camera is predicting your gender, your age, and your race with extraordinarily high accuracy. It also knows whether you like the thing that you see in front of you. And if we were allowed to do so, all of the advertising that, would be, that, would, that is displayed in the ILAC Center would be personalized to you. Um, 
And these things, this, this, uh, this mannequin in the center is, a, is an IC mannequin. Her eyes are cameras, and using gaze detection, she knows um, your gender, your race, your age with very, very high accuracy. Um, and she also knows whether you like the thing that you're looking at on the mannequin. So for example, you know, you like the shoes, you like the trousers, you like the shirt, but you only buy the shirt, and so you go to the cash register, you take the shirt with you, and so the person gets an opportunity to upsell because you've carried a phone in your pocket so they know who you are. Um, raising lots and lots of ethical issues, right? Um, so if you're interested in AI, I suppose, really seriously in terms of where it's going, I'd encourage you to look at the 100-year AI study at Stanford. Um, and it's a very long report, but as with everything, you can summarize it in two slides. Um, so there are trends, which are technical things. So the technical trends in AI, so vision, reinforcement learning, deep learning, which you, which you hear about all the time. Um, there's also what they're looking at. Um, and you'll also find that in different domains that there are different focus areas. So for example, in health, people are interested in um, elder care and all these sorts of things. Um, moving on, I suppose if you look at the current big opportunities in AI, you'll come across the Sustainable Development Goals. There's a unit within um, the Office of the Director General of the UN called U the UN Global Pulse, which looks at AI solutions and big data solutions for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And you might all say, well, what, 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 what's that about? So how can, you, how can you deal with no hunger, for example, when it comes using AI? And what the UN Global Pulse do, for example, is they publish um, examples of projects that they're working on to achieve that. So for example, on zero hunger, crowdsourcing or tracking food prices listed online to help monitor food security in near real time. So they're very, very specific things, um, but show the power of data in some sense. Um, and of course, you'll hear, you see lots of prizes. So there's in our conferences, IBM has an X prize, which I'm a judge on, um, which is trying to, you know, people are, you hear this expression, AI for good, um, which, you know, it's hard to object to, you know, like, uh, it's like quality, you know, nobody can object to quality, but nobody really knows what it is. So good for who is the question. Um, now, I suppose one of the big challenges is bias in AI. So this is another issue. So I suppose we've made massive technological um, advances. There are serious issues. Um, one of the serious issues is around bias. And so people normally think, well, you know, if I think really carefully, I can sort of eliminate my biases. And you, you can't, of course. There are lots of psychological experiments that ask you to complete a form where you, where you tick all the, all the boxes saying how unbiased you are. And there's a subsequent test that sort of tests that bias, and it demonstrates that we're massively biased. Um, this is, um, there's some fantastic books written on this sort of stuff. Um, there's Cathy O'Neill's book on weapons of mass destruction. There are other things like uh, artificial unintelligence. Um, there's, there are many, many books now highlighting examples where bias in algorithms is causing all sorts of problems. And, um, you know, bias is all sorts of things, like, uh, you know, some examples, algorithmic bias you hear about all the time. So this is a very scientific experiment around in my office where I typed in Google, uh, cute babies into Google. Um, and these are indeed very cute babies. Um, and of course, if the slide was maybe three times longer, you would see many more babies exactly like this. But of course, they're all pasty white and pink. Um, so, and that's because Google thinks that I will find uh, babies that are pasty pink uh, more cute than babies who are not pasty pink which of course is not true. Um, and you'll find other things, like uh, apart from algorithmic bias, you'll find things like interaction bias. So AI systems that learn by observing humans, and usually the data sets for these are observed online. And of course, how we behave online is very different to how we behave in the real world. And so Tay was basically a chatbot that learned by observing um, how people interacted. So you can imagine if your data set on how human beings interact is how people communicate with Donald Trump on Twitter. It isn't representative of how people sort of talk to each other on, in daily life, right? So it's a very biased data set. You often hear of personalization. Uh, AI is often used for personalization. And this is a bias because obviously we get to see more things that we've seen before. Um, and lots of recommender systems people, when you talk to them, are oblivious to this. This is a, that, that they are creating technology that creates bias. Um, there are other things that are very, very difficult to get. So most, of the, most of these things, in some sense, you could sort of imagine technological solutions to. You could imagine that, you know, just be careful about it. But there are things you can't be careful about, and one thing is language. Like, if you look at how, the, how languages have evolved, particularly um, languages where, um, that have, that have gender-based pronouns, then you find that there's lots of inbuilt bias that we simply can't get rid of because it's baked into the language. 
And so if you send an AI system off to read the content of the National Library, it's going to be biased. So we can't get rid of that. The other thing that AI systems can't do is explain. Um, this isn't generally true, but it's true of most of the, of the cutting-edge machine learning systems. So this is a sort of a, a funny New Yorker cartoon. I love New Yorker cartoons. Um, it's worth buying the New Yorker just for the cartoons, actually. Um, so, AI, so I made this funny remark about my, uh, about my Labrador, but I mean that seriously. You know, th there are deep learning systems. So deep learning systems cannot explain to you in any way what it is that they understand about a problem. And so in that sense, they are no different from my Labrador. So my Labrador can't tell you why she thinks one thing is a carrot and one thing is meat. Um, and that is, when you think of deploying AI systems, for example, in diagnosing cancer, you can imagine an interaction where a patient comes in, sits down, and, say, and the doctor says, well, you, you have stage four or whatever kind of cancer. The, the patient is likely to say, well, yeah, but why do you think that? And AI systems can't explain. Um, in fact, not only that, but AI, I was talk, at this health conference yesterday, there was a number of people talking about using deep learning for various tasks. And I was making the, problem, I was making the point that actually you can, you can force a machine learning system to misclassify examples in all sorts of curious ways. And there's a field called, um, well, there's an area called the development of adversarial examples, where people develop examples specifically to fool deep learning systems, and so in ways that you would not expect. So this, these are just images from a, from a paper on archive, and they're all examples of, paper, of images that have been modified in a way to fool a learning system into thinking that there's something else. Um, so for example, these, are not stop, these things think that they're not stop signs, these are, 40, these are interpreted as 45 mile an hour speed limits. Um, these obviously, this is not an African grey bird, that's not an Indian elephant, and that's not an elephant either. Um, but there are ways of modifying examples in ways that ensure that an AI system will misclassify them. And you know, the reason we're interested in this is because it allows us to test robustness of AI systems. So uh, there's all sorts of issues around, uh, ethical issues around job loss. Um, I'm, I don't believe that there's going to be massive job loss as a consequence of AI, but certainly jobs will change. And if, um, you know, the perfect example of, you know, techn but technology has always done that. You know, if you, were, if you were a stagecoach driver, a stagecoach driver in the early 1900s, um, you know, your job was on the line. Your job was going to disappear. Um, but, you know, the extent to which AI is going to have a catastrophic impact on jobs, I, d I don't believe is going to happen. Um, so just moving along quickly, um, obviously other issues on ethics that we're concerned about now is the development of killer robots, um, as you hear about them, so lethal autonomous weapon systems, and the, the, um, by and large, the consensus in the artificial intelligence community is that we should not be developing AI technology that's going to be deployed in uh, weapon systems. And one of the reasons for this is that we don't want, nobody wants to be killed by an AI. No, of course, nobody wants to be killed full stop. But um, I suppose the real issue is that we don't want to give responsibility and authority to something that is not human for making decisions as to whether somebody should be killed or not. Um, in fact, there is a, there's an ongoing academic by, uh, boycott of some universities. There's a university in South Korea, for example, which has, developed, which has introduced a lab focused on lethal atomic weapon systems. And there is a, an academic boycott. Um, there's an international academic boycott of that. I don't believe in academic boycotts because if you don't, if, 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 the last thing you want to do is, is stop talking to each other. But I'm just saying that it exists. Right? Um, and if you look at the ethics of AI, uh, uh, two weeks ago, the AI for People um, initiative published a, uh, a policy document on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And basically, it's around these five <coughs> issues um, enabling human wrongdoing. So you, we, we don't want to do that. Um, we don't want to devalue human skills. We don't want to erode human self-determination. We don't want to reduce human control. We don't want to remove human responsibility. And when you start thinking of these sort, sort of things, you might sort of say, well, you know, okay, what does that mean? Some of these things are actually quite far-reaching. So, for, for example, if you, if you think of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and people's voting preferences, then this is manipulated by social media. Um, and there's an ethical issue there, right? So there's an ethical issue around selling, trying to sell to you a product that you might not ne that you might like, but don't necessarily need or want. Um, the removing of human responsibility is an interesting one because there are there are countries that have now started developing policies around <coughs> giving legal status to artificial intelligence systems. So, curiously, for example, Saudi Arabia has given um, citizenship to the so to Sophia the robot. 
which I think is hilarious because, so, well, first of all, this robot has a female name, and it's probably the only female in Saudi Arabia that gets to walk, that gets to exist without a head appear in public without being dressed in a particular way. And I think actually there's a sort of misogyny associated with, with the fact that lots of AI systems are given female names because if these damn things are going to fail, well, let let it be a woman who does it, you know. Um, and I've no evidence for that apart from the fact that I don't know very many AI systems that have male names and. Um, that, that's interesting. But of course, coming back to Sophia, the fact she's got citizenship is a dangerous issue because the reason that people think, the reason that some camps believe this is a good thing is so that we can, we have something to sue if AI goes wrong. But of course, the real problem is that if, you, if these things have, have identities, then we don't, we no longer, they no longer have, there's a, there's a removal of human responsibility for their actions. Um, so uh, um, Hawking has often said things like existential threat to humanity. Um, I had the pleasure of arguing with him. Um, and who am I to argue with Stephen Hawking? But um, I didn't think this, I thought that this was interesting as a thought experiment, but not practical. Um, so I suppose when you look at AI, people talk about whether it's going to replace, whether it's going to augment or automate in the middle. And I think AI technology has always been, by and large, augmenting um, rather than automating or replacing. And the challenge with AI and the challenge in policy making in AI is separating what is real from what is not real. So for example, you'll often hear in the media people talking about, well, the, the, the solution to fake news is AI. No, it isn't, because AI has absolutely no hope against, um, against fake news. Like if I point to you, if I point a story to you and I ask you, is that story true or false? The amount of work that you would have to do in order to prove that it's true or false is vast. Like the understanding of language, the understanding of context, the understanding of facts, the understanding of spin, AI is nowhere close to that. Um, so let's talk about policy for a second. So I suppose one of the things that we're concerned about is all of these issues. So you know, massive technological advancement, there are ethical issues that we need to deal with. Um, and I suppose also the people in Brussels are very concerned at the fact that um, that Europe seems to be lagging behind in AI. Now the curious thing is when you speak, I've never met, so in the process of working with the commission, I've met lots of government officials and the, the most common thing you'll find when you speak to government officials about artificial intelligence is that every government feels that the country is lagging behind in AI. Even the Chinese think they're lagging behind in AI. When the rest of the world thinks they're running away with it. Um, so, um, there's this, and of course, this is the this is the tyranny of metrics to some extent, because how do you measure these things? And I suppose some some reports show that you know China is completely dominating on scientific publication, which is true. Um, about two years ago, the American Association for AI's annual conference had about 50% of its submissions and papers were from China. In fact, there were sessions that were entire, entirely attended by Chinese people, entirely presented. All papers were Chinese. And apart from the fact that people like me and a couple of others were sitting in the room, the whole session was, the session was conducted in English. We left just in the hope that people could you know, maybe speak in their own language and not give such poor talks. Um, but uh, China has completely dominated. And there's a couple of things about that, right? One is that the, that the ethical approach to AI in China is very different to how we deal with AI. So for example, one of the things, one of the red lines that we're developing, that we're proposing to the commission from the high-level expert group is the notion of citizen scoring. And citizen scoring is, um, is rife in China. So um, you know, you are, your own score is, there is a social credit system in China that's been developed. Um, and your, your, your personality, your, um, your worthiness, your uh, patriotism is being scored automatically. And the question is, you know, to what extent should we allow social scoring of any kind to be used against human beings? Um, Facebook are now using um, uh, personal scoring to deal with content moderation. So if I complain constantly that, that um, stories are inappropriate and Joyce does this, <coughs> regularly does it, um, then we are being scored on the basis of which ones were upheld. And so if I'm considered to be a crank, or as Joyce is considered to be reliable, and when she flags something, it's important, then that's, that they score us based on, on that, so that they, they then, next time that Joyce reports something, they'll take notice, next time I report something, they'll just ignore me. Um, and the question is, that, is that appropriate? Now, of course, all sorts of agencies um, do uh, scoring. 
Uh, but the problem is that they're not transparent. Um, in terms of companies, Europe is lagging behind in companies. We're lagging behind in investment. We have probably lost the, um, the business-to-consumer AI markets. We're probably, um, and I think when you speak to the Commission, they probably don't even want to compete on that. Uh, they want to compete on business-to-business. -business. They want to compete on business-to-government. And um, with very good reason, I suppose, Europe is a leader in business-to-business. -business. So things like robotics, industrial robotics, uh, supply chain management. If you think of companies like SAP, for example, um, there's no real equivalence or competitive in the US. Um, so these are the areas that they want us to focus on. Um, so over the last number of years, uh, there's Ken, and uh, there's Ken's in there. Ken's also on the slide. So uh, we had this uh, workshop in January, just to give you a sense of what's going on. Um, so from there, we produced a report, um, a very short report, but it gives you a summary of what, what was going on in Europe in AI at that point. And we invited um, all European member states, we invited a representative of government, representative of industry, a representative of academia. Um, to attend that, and most countries, not all, uh, came along. So you can read a sort of a potted history of what's going on in these various countries. Taking a very broad definition of what Europe is, so for example, Israel is included here, um, and so on. If you look at what's been happening <coughs> since then, um, in March, there was a, a document published, The Age of Artificial Intelligence, which I'd highly recommend you read. Um, it gives you a sense of what's going on in AI, where AI is, and it articulates in some sense for the first time I suppose, the European priorities for AI. And these are things like um, creating an environment where companies can succeed. Um, and it's very interesting when, when you look at what happens behind the scenes in the, uh, in the market. Cuckoo Robots, which was one of the jewels in the European crown in artificial intelligence, was recently bought by, the Chinese, by a Chinese firm. Um, when, you speak to, when you speak to policymakers in Brussels, they, they refer to that as the Chinese government bought Cuckoo Robots, which is probably true. Um, and they paid twice the market cap of, for Cuckoo Robots. And in fact, when this occurred, there was huge concern in Europe around, about the purchase, of, about the acquisition of Cuckoo Robots, to the extent, actually, that the European Commission tried to buy Cuckoo Robots um, ahead of the Chinese. So the Chinese were actually in a bidding war for Cuckoo Robots against the European Commission. Um, and the European Commission essentially were trying to get large European companies to buy Cuckoo Robots to, to, to ensure that it remains a European com company, which is kind of daft, you know, when you think about it, you know? Like, we live in a globalized world. Uh, unfortunately, the Chinese have very deep pockets. Um, so we want to strengthen the AI talent base. So, for example, in the last number of months, there have been calls from Science Foundation Ireland, for example, on Centers for Research Training. Um, you see these sorts of things arising right across Europe. Um, we have a shortage of talent, as they say, but everybody has a shortage of talent. You know, it's not, it's not that, there's a, that there's a surplus of talent somewhere that we need to attract to Europe. There's a, there's a fundamental lack of that everywhere. I suppose the big thing that we want to create in Europe is this human-centered approach to AI. And that means that AI should be developed for the human being, for the citizen, and you will see <coughs> lots of red, red lines in recommendations from this high-level expert group that, that um, try to counter any attempts to develop AI technologies that are not human-centered, that are not individually centered. Um, and uh, we're coming again, uh, there's lots of pushback on that because obviously the high-level expert group has academics involved, it has NGOs involved, but it also has corporates involved. And so it's, it's an interesting dynamic, to say the least. Um, I could tell you all sorts of stories about the funny sort of games that happen um, when, you're, uh, when you're working on ethics. For example, big corporations asking you to come and uh, get involved. Uh, so big corporations that will rename nameless, um, unless I'm asked who they are, in which case I'll tell you. Um, doing things like come and tell us about, uh, come and tell us what you're doing in the high level expert group, and we'll show you everything we're doing on ethics and artificial intelligence. Oh, but by the way, does this NDA that you need to sign before you come? You know, um, it's the classic, uh, you know, shoot them before they arrive. And of course, you sign that thing, you can't actually participate in the high level expert group at all. So um, you'd be surprised at how many corporations actually try that, that silly trick. Um, so the race is on in AI. So what's happening? So um, I suppose if you look at strategies, you'll find that the, that the East um, is way ahead. You know, uh, Korea, Singapore, uh, Japan, they have very well-defined principles. Japan has a, has a Society 5.0 strategy, which is about three pages long. Um, 
you pick it up and so I say, well, is that, is that all I'm getting as a strategy? Um, but it's actually a very, very uh, well thought out strategy. Um, the Chinese government are putting enormous amounts of money into AI. I mean, absolutely enormous amounts of money. Uh, there is no bottom to the amount of money that uh, the, the Chinese are prepared to put into AI. Um, and interestingly, Chinese AI companies are all over Europe. You know, in fact, um, I, I don't mention any companies' names, but there are Chinese companies that have uh, that have essentially, uh, by stealth, um, create massive presence in Europe, um, which is interesting. Um, China's development plan is interesting when you look at it because it basically says by 2030 we want to be the world leader in artificial intelligence and they're on time. Um, uh, they're doing incredible things. Um, in the West, well, Canada has, I suppose in the West, Canada is the center of excellence in AI. On the high level expert group we have um, Jean-François Gagné who's the CEO of Element AI and he's also the advisor to the Canadian government on AI. And some things that the Canadian government are doing sound completely mad. Like there's, a, there's actually a KPI in government departments in Canada which requires that X percent of their funding, I think something of the order of 10%, is put into, is put into projects that are so high risk that that money is associated with failure. Um, so a KPI in the Canadian government is that you invest in things that are so bloody high risk that they do actually fail. And if they haven't failed, then you haven't tried hard enough. Um, which is interesting because in the commission, in, in Europe, if a, if a European project fails, for example, it's, cons it's actually considered fraud. There's a fraud department that kicks into play because either the reviewers got it wrong or the people who promised the science got it wrong, um, but it's considered fraud, right? So that's interesting. Um, the US is basically adopting the strategy of build it and we will fix it later. Um, and in the UK, I suppose the only co countries that have really formally adopted strategies are Finland and the UK. Um, the chair of the high-level expert group it was also the chair of the Finnish um, AI task force. And the French government have actually uh, established Mission Villiani, which is, um, which if you're familiar with French mathematics, he is uh, considered the uh, Lady Gaga of French science. Um, and uh, he wears a purple shirt, he wears a purple jacket, he wears a spider, he's got, you know, he's got the big fluffy thing. He's quite a character, but brilliant. Um, so in terms of France, I, like, there are lots of examples I can share with you of particular strategies. They, they basically all look at the same kinds of things. So what's happening with data, so data ownership, data privacy, skills is a big thing, it's ubiquitous. Um, so innovation, infrastructure, so what kind of infrastructure should we have? Um, so these are all the, the big issues. Um, in Europe, in fact, um, there was a document that I'd also really recommend you read called The Communication and AI, which came out in, in April. Um, really worth reading because it is basically the, the structure for the European strategy in AI. Um, and I suppose out of it came the High Level Expert Group. And the High Level Expert Group, as I said at the beginning, does these three things. Um, it's chaired by uh, Pekka Alapitala, who is the former president of Nokia Mobile Phones. He was the chair of the Finnish AI strategy. Um, Noza is uh, director of research at INRIA. She's responsible for the ethics dimension, and I've, I'm responsible for the policy and investment side. Um, and it's interesting, you would expect that there would be greater heat around policy and investment because that's what the money is. In fact, it isn't. The, the, the real challenge is actually on defining the, ethic, the ethical guidelines. And part of the reason is because it's very philosophical. Um, so trying to get the ideas is very difficult. So there's an AI alliance which I, which I would encourage you to join. It's a place where you can uh, have your say. It's a place where you can read all about European strategies in AI, uh, international strategies in AI. So if you're interested in what the Canadian government are doing in AI, um, that's the place to go. Um, Canada is regarded as the hub on AI today. In no, sh in no small part because of Jeff Hinton, the great-great-grandson of George Boole. Um, and I suppose this is the place to go. For, um, if you can't be bothered uh, Googling it, then you can just take down this, uh, this URL um, and get involved in the discussions because it's very, very important. Um, I suppose two big initiatives, just before I finish. Um, so as well as this sort of stuff, which, which you could regard as top-down, there's an initiative called the Clare Initiative, which is a bottom-up research strategy for AI. And what they want to do is develop essentially a CERN for AI, 
which personally I think is a very bad idea because we don't need a CERN type infrastructure for artificial intelligence. Um, but, and of course there's also the other question, what, what I call the UN question, there's a, there's a, there's a very famous, well, um, an Irish diplomat that I th think very highly of, Tim Ma. Um, anytime you come up with a good idea that I've ever spoken to, Tim always asks the following question, yeah, but who's going to own it? You know, um, which is, which is a, a very smart question. And of course, the problem with Claire is that if they build a CERN for AI, the big question is, well, who's going to own it? Is it going to be France? Is it going to be Germany? It's certainly not going to exist in Ireland. Um, and so, um, but this is, you know, there, there are lots of facets that are interesting about this. There's also um, an initiative called the Ellis Initiative, uh, which is another bottom-up um, approach, which focuses on research excellence in artificial intelligence. And of course, you know, there's nothing to be argued about in terms of, of academic excellence. We all want academic excellence. But again, when you talk to people at the commission, they think of these things as, um, they think of the investment that's going to be made in basic research, in research at all in, um, in artificial intelligence to be a very tiny <coughs> proportion of the wedge. You know, that the big wedge is going to, the, big, the large proportion of the wedge is going to come from governments, it's going to come from industry. Um, and so while these are important, uh, they're fighting about a proportion of the funding that isn't actually the largest portion by any manner. I suppose one of the things I've learned about um, doing the high-level expert group is that uh, politics is far more difficult than science, which is what I, like I'm a trained mathematician, and um, it's interesting um, doing political science policy. You kind of have to learn very, very quickly because um, there are all sorts of funny tricks that people pull on you that um, I did not expect, um, and so I'm happy to talk about that too. But it's fun, actually. I think I enjoy, I think I enjoy this more than I enjoy uh, sitting in the lab now, um, which is kind of fun. Um, so join this AI Alliance and have, a, have a, a participate in the debate. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks. Thanks very much.